Good evening. This is uh, Monday, June 12, 2023. It is 6 p.m. and this is a meeting, committee meeting of the Community and Economic Development Committee. My name is Jeff Schilling. I'm the chair. I have Mr. Pierce to my left and Mrs. Snee to my right. And we are here tonight to provide a recommendation for council regarding the recommendation of the Troy Planning Commission regarding Ordinance number 028-2023, rezone 58.093 acres at uh, 3054 West State Route 55 from county zoning of A2 General Agriculture District to the city zoning of R5 Single Family Residence District. Uh, Mr. Titter and Titter, we have, we have somebody going to help us with this tonight? Uh, we have several staff members who are available for comments or questions. Um, you had the public hearing at the uh, at the last council meeting. We did. Uh, so there have been two readings, and so it's really a matter for the for the committee. You mentioned that the planning commission recommended uh, eight to one to approve. Uh, sorry, eight to one, six to one to uh, approve or to uh, approve the rezoning. So with that, I we're good to go. You. Okay. Um, committee members, any questions or comments? I do have a question. Okay. I'm I'm just wondering um, if consideration was given looking at the surrounding uh, zoning to having this zoned R4 rather than R5 for slightly less density. Um, I mean, we've we've discussed several different uh, versions of uh, uh, different residential districts. R4 was certainly one of them. Uh, the application was for R5, um, and if council, just so you know, that if the council wished to approve a different type of zoning, it would be uh, it would require a super majority. Uh, does it have to go back to the planning commission? It would not. Would not go back to the no. planning commission. If you vary from the uh, the planning commission, then it has to be, I believe, seven out of nine to uh, seventy-five percent uh, to approve any other zoning than the uh, than the R five. Great, great. Okay, I think um, we're going to mix things up a little bit here. I think we're going to have audience participation first, and then that will allow council to. Could, uh, I, could I request that there are any other? Comments from council members. Just we can. I was going to reserve that till after we hear from the public. Okay. That way we can get everything out on the table, and then we we can uh, do it then. So let's uh, let's open it up to uh, public comment. And um, again, if you if you spoke uh, at the public hearing, we really appreciate that you did that. Uh, and you may want to mention that you had had uh, spoke at the public hearing and, and maybe keep your uh, again you take time as you want of course um, but um, you know hopefully we are listening the first time so uh, who would like to start with uh, public comments okay I think you knew I was going to comment just showing up. <laughs> my name is Sarah Camphrey. I live at 1100 Winchester Drive. Um, my property is um, adjacent to that piece of land. Um, several of you probably received emails from me today. Hopefully you all received them, actually, and they went through. Um, I, I, I don't want to necessarily for everyone with reiterating what I've already written um, to, you know, the three of you particularly that are on this committee. Um, but for the sake of 
everyone else in here. I, I would just like to go through them very quickly. I did speak last week at the hearing, um, and you know, I I am trying to basically make sure that my neighbors and I are being heard in this regard. Um, so, you know, I I sent an email because um, so last week after the meeting, I. I did have a chance to speak with several people from the city. Um, they came up to me, and I appreciated that because some of this, you know, having three little kids, I may not be as up to speed on some of these things, may not be able to research it until kind of last minute. So, um, you know, some guidance on, you know, just some of the next steps was, was appreciated. But um, I was also told by Tim Davis that the city is working on an update to the comprehensive plan for the city. Um, he actually invited me if I was interested in participating as a, as a uh, member of the community to email him, and I did. I noticed he is actually out on vacation until Wednesday. But um, just I wanted to point out that it seems prudent that, you know, perhaps the city council wait, um, and particularly, you know, this, this committee wait um, on that decision for rezoning of the property, especially considering that the proposed rezoning doesn't appear to be consistent with the zoning of other neighborhoods, as Mrs. Snee mentioned, um, which is one of my points. Um, the other concern I brought up at the end of the council meeting was that the housing that the developer described during his comments was not affordable housing. And I did see that he's here tonight, so maybe he can dispute that, maybe not. But, um, you know, Mr. Graves of the Chamber of Commerce um, this, this, the workforce housing, affordable housing, is what the city is looking for. And having homes that are 1,800 square feet to 3,000 square feet starting at $250,000 is not affordable housing. Um, it's very inaccessible, actually, to people who are working in area factories that are part of our economic infrastructure, really, of the city, like Clope, Conagra, Pella, for instance. Um, especially considering increases in property taxes that went into effect this year and increases in interest rates. That's further pushed home ownership out of reach for a lot of people, and so that's not actually affordable. And so the definition of affordability has kind of been altered based on some of these just economic conditions, not just of Troy, but really of the country as a whole. Um, you know, affordable housing could really be achieved, you know, through smaller, more modestly priced homes. Even with the current cost of building materials rising, I think you could still do that with a smaller home. Or even through redevelopment of some of the vacant properties um, that are multifamily units, you know, in other areas of the city, that would better achieve that plan. Um, one of the other points I, I want to come back to also is the size and the age of Concord uh, schools and the impact that the potential addition of so many uh, students would have on it. So um, unbeknownst to me, uh, but looking into it further this past week, you know, the Troy School Board has been meeting the last couple months. I looked at the meetings from the last couple months' uh, meetings. And uh, as you pro probably already know, this, the school has uh, been recently approved to receive state funding from the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission that would cover 42% of the cost of new buildings in the district if the district can raise the other 58%. So that's really exciting to hear. Um, I'm not sure how I missed that news except for the fact that May is always a crazy month of the year and so I probably just missed it for that reason. But um, I'm also concerned because I've seen a lot of comments already from people in the district um, citizens who either have kids in the district or whose kids are grown and not, no longer in school in the district who are already rejecting the possibility of new schools um, because they want to know what's going to be done with the old schools, what's going to be done with that property. Um, and those who still believe that neighborhood schools are actually the way to go even though many of our elementary children don't actually attend the neighborhood schools like they are in, these people are envisioning or they're seeing, you know, um, in, in like having that neighborhood school where kids can walk to school every day. That's not really the case. And with Concord, it's definitely not the case because Concord covers so much land area. 
um, with the possibility of the new schools and you know these early concern of the citizens, it would again seem to be a prudent move for the city council to wait to rezone any additional property for residential housing until it can be understood where those new schools are going to be located in the city, how large the buildings are going to be, and you know ideally sized for potential growth um, based on the city's comprehensive plan, you know, ideally the updated comprehensive plan as well. So that, you know, additional developments are really done in a sustainable way for the city. So a lot of us see the residential growth and expansion of the city updating school buildings to be an intertwined issue. And, you know, one of my questions is, is there any work being done by this committee, actually in particular community and economic development, with the school district to make sure that a bond issue is actually successful for those new school buildings. And then um, one of my last points actually came about thanks to last night. <laughs> the storm last night, um, you know, it's one of those that I don't know if anybody would con consider it a 100-year storm kind of storm, but there was flooding all over that field last night. There's Poor drainage, the poor drainage that the two farmers mentioned from last week's um, public hearing, we saw it, I took pictures of it, I sent it to uh, <laughs> Mr. Phillips because he lives, he's our ward representative so I sent that to him, but you know, the southbound lane um, for Nashville Road was partially covered. People had to be driving in the northbound lane going south to get around the water that was flooding uh, that part of the road from the field. It's actually made worse right now because the farmer, I don't know if he's been told not to farm that field because of what's going on or if he has just said I'm not doing it until we figure out what's going on with that property, but it's actually a bit worse right now because there's overgrowth in it. Um, and normally it would be farmed, it would still flood, but normally with it being farmed, it would at least not be as bad in the ditch as it was last night. But my sump pumps are running. They're running every 30 seconds. They'll, it'll lighten up over the next couple of days, but my sump pumps will be running for the next at least 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours, because of the rain that comes just from that one period of time we had last night. So um, I really appreciate having the public comment period last week, and I appreciate the time to be given comments again this evening. Thank you. One question. You live in the Kennington? Yes. Okay, That's so you're actually across the street from this new division, right? Mm -hmm. this, new, this proposed subdivision. That's correct, yes. So you're not adjacent, you're across the street then? Yeah. Okay, thank you so I much. I mean, adjacent isn't adjacent like across the street. It's not touching your yard, it's just you got to go across Nashville Road. Right, there's, there's like nothing touching it right now though. Okay. So, but thank yes. you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other public comments? Good evening, everybody. John Bills with DDC Management, uh, the applicant, um, 3601 Rigby Road. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to, to come here uh, before the committee here tonight and for the opportunity uh, last week. Um, Again, I, I shared most of, I think, the thoughts last week uh, that everybody got to hit here. I did want to talk a little bit. Um, I had heard a little bit about uh, the potential for R4 or, or that had come up in discussion, so I did wanted to kind of address that and talk a little bit about density and, and try to understand um, if that's something council ultimately or this committee and council wanted to go for, like the goal in going to R4 versus R5 and give a little bit on, on the project itself about density, um, which was mentioned here before. So the R5 uh, that, that we're, we've applied for and that we're asking for, um, we had worked through with staff previously and talked about how with the new comprehensive plan and how like transitional, how it would start to move that way as it moved forward. And so we've done a little bit of research and looking at the, the communities that are nearby um, and surrounding and there are um, R4 and there are PUD, I believe the Kensington that is right next door. 
um, all not adjacent but across the street and then I think across uh, the highway is R4 um, to the north there. And uh, while we're not here for a plan tonight, a, a proposed plan, we have submitted you know, one to the city before and had conversations. And it's not so much about getting the density up significantly more. So the, the Kensington uh, subdivision uh, the, directly across the PUD and their density is over 2.8, it's between 2.8 and 2.9 units to the acre. Uh, the, the plan that we have put together right now um, that would fit the R5 is a little bit more than that. It's at 3.3, I believe, if I remember correctly. So it is slightly higher, but still consistent with a transitional. Um, if you keep it exactly the same all the, all the way throughout a city, there's no such thing as a transition. So it's not like we're coming in trying to get five units to the acre or six units to the acre or some much larger number. Um, it is a little bit more at the 3.2 the or 3.3 uh, that we have in the plan now. But that's what I want to understand, you know, when we say density, what is exactly we're looking for. There's other things about the R5 that is appealing to us and we believe can be appealing to the city. By going for R5 allows for 50 foot wide lots and five foot yard setbacks. So you end up with a 40 foot wide home on it that is deeper like we talked about uh, in the meeting uh, last week. Going to an R4, the lot has to become a little bit bigger. It has to be 60 foot wide. But the side yard setbacks uh, also increase. It's 15 foot total. So you're left with, at max, a 45-foot wide house. It's 15 total, and you can split them up a little bit, but you're left with a 45-foot wide building pad for it to go on there. The reality is builders, every builder we work with, they don't have a 45-foot wide product. It's 40-foot or 50-foot, and it's standardized across all of it. So even going to the R5, or R4 from an R5, the exact same house would be built that's going to be built on the R5. It just would have slightly bigger side yards. What does that mean for both us and for the city? It means it's more expensive. If we talk about affordability, and there is debate on what affordable housing is anymore with what construction prices, I'm not going to argue that. It, it's different today than what it was 10 years ago and 10 years before that. But what I can tell you is having a bigger lot with the same value of the home on it all it's doing is increasing, reducing affordability. It costs us more to put the roads in, and it costs the town more to maintain that subdivision down the road. It's that much more road for the same uh, property tax that you're getting. The same residents living there with the same income tax. The home's not any bigger, and it's not creating more real estate tax for it. So when we've gone to that, that's, that's more of the appealing. In, in the plan that we submitted, that is R5, like I said, it's only slightly higher density. What that also allows us to do is cluster the homes a little bit more. The plan we have has a little bit over 20% green space, I think 20.9, so a little under 21% green space in it. R5 only requires 3%. We're not trying to come in here and just maximize every number of home that we can put in there but we want it to be efficient, both for road cost for us as well as road cost for the future. PUD only requires 10% in Troy. And again, we're almost at 21% with the plan that we're proposing. So it's not that we're here trying to just maximize density, put lots everywhere, but we do want it to be efficient to keep the affordability there and also to reduce the future costs for the town as they take on and maintain it. Stormwater's also was big last time, and I'll just reiterate, We'll get into stormwater design. What I do know is we will make it better. We won't make it worse by detaining it, slowing the release, focusing the release. Uh, we work through that with all of our projects. I understand that the uh, farm field floods today. Um, that's not uncommon with what we uh, deal with in other communities. But we will work through that design with the engineers and with uh, the EPA to make sure we are managing stormwater properly as we move forward with it. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak and would be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for you. Yeah. 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 Mr. Chair. Um, are you opposed to a plan development? Um, we would prefer to go with the uh, standard zoning uh, of the R5. If I may ask, is, is there a drawback to the plan? Development that um, a lot of the duration, and again, it just opens like for approvals and to go through it, and we'd be starting back over with that. Um, we believe uh, the the R five 
uh, meets what we need, and it's obviously a zoning that the the city has out there, and they they like. And then we basically will work with staff. We'll come back for final engineering and go through that, um, but it doesn't go back through the normal PUD process. So we would prefer to go with the R5 to do straight zoning. Any other questions? Um, if I may follow up, so with with the IP uh, PD and that's planned development. And your uh, my PUD experience is public utilities. Oh, uh, and I apologize. It's made different things in different. And I apologize for that. The PD. Okay, gotcha. Um, so an HOA would not be something that would be in the. Oh no, we'll have an HOA in here. Even though straight zoned, we'll still have ponds. We'll still have all that. We set up an HOA to take care of the green space with the 21% green space. Um, they'll be take care of the ponds, they'll take care of the green space, all of that. No different than a PD would. So what? how would it affect you if there was an amendment to uh, suggest or require a PD with this? Um, I'm not, I guess I don't know how that works. Uh, my understanding is you're either, you, I'm sorry. I don't either, Mr. Phillips. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The PD follows a project. I, I the it. underlying zoning must be uh, residential, in this case, for a residential PD to be eligible to be submitted. But that is very project specific after the, the conventional zoning is set. So that's so, that would okay, be step one. Can, so when. Okay, let me see if I got that right. Okay, so if if we approve the zoning, then can the, the would staff then come back and ask for a, a PD, or would that? Uh, the, the if you went with R five and that's what he wanted and that's what you did not want, did not want, then um, I would not advise that you do that. Only because if it's established as R five. The, and the developer then submits a plan that complies with all of the requirements of the R5, you have no leverage to ask or require a, a PD be submitted instead. Okay. Okay. That's, is that is that your No, your yeah, I'm, I'm just curious then when I look at this zoning map that I see Kensington and I don't see the underlying zoning. I just see it labeled as what I'm assuming means a plan development, even though it's the PUD. So what is the underlying zoning of Kensington? Is it R3, R4? Well, that would have been uh, it's a 20, 20 plus R3 years R3 ago. Believe, Do we yeah. know what that okay, I'm just curious. That that yep, there was a map that showed that. Uh, yeah. so it doesn't show me what keep that in mind, is. Keep in mind that 20 to 25 yeah, R3, years ago, whenever R3, this was set, if not two, longer, R2. Yeah, but uh, the that's what I'm the standards and the requirements were different than so an R three four two whatever don't mean the same now. And I, I guess what I'm wondering is when I when I look at this on the map, mm -hmm. is what on Kensington then similar to what our current R five would be, or it, more like R four that or R three that is both adjacent to it? it it's probably a hybrid between R three and R four. Yes. Okay. But the old R3 R4. Correct. Questions? Okay. Okay, I've got some comments I'd like to just go over real quickly. Um, you know, we we've done this. I've done this enough. I you know that the things that have been brought up have been brought up about every. Uh, annexation, residential annexation that we that we have dealt with since being on council. So, you know, number one, drainage. Uh, what I see is that uh, the way the, the these subdivisions are engineered now with the with the drainage ponds, uh, again, you're going to have streets, curbs, sidewalks, you're going to have inside the subdivision. Um, storm drains, the storm drains essentially flow into a retention pond. The fields, when you have a, a farm field, that water goes anywhere it wants to. So yes, it'll flood National Road and that type of thing, but typically, the, uh, you know, once, once the subdivision is established, 
you know, the water runs off, runs off, runs into the street, runs down to the storm drains, into the retention pond. The retention pond has to fill up before the water is in flows out of the retention pond into either a, uh, uh, you know, the side ditch along the road, or again, a lot of times, like I know a couple of them, they flow into a creek, you know, and so uh, when you drive out, I don't care whether you're out on the, uh, the west end of town or the north end of town, you see all these drainage ponds, that's a lot of water. I mean, you're talking thousands of gallons of water that flow into these ponds, and if, and if the ponds don't fill up, the water essentially then evaporates. So it doesn't even get to the doesn't even get the out of the pod, and I think this is a you know, from what I have seen this is a very effective way to essentially manage stormwater drainage. Um, and again, they're engineered. We, we got uh, so, so, you know these these uh, these companies come in and engineer these things, and and uh, they've had a lot of experience. A lot of them have have had experience. And if I'm wrong, correct me on this thing. But um, you know, again, that I just see this as, as they, they seem to function very well. In other words, um, we you know we talked about increased traffic, um, and yes, this subdivision will create increased traffic. But I know when somebody bought a house out in Kensington, one of the questions that they didn't ask is, is well, are my vehicles going to be the tipping point uh, between having uh, severe traffic and and uh, uh, you know traffic that's livable? So uh, you know, again, you know, when when Kensington and and some of these other subdivisions were built out there. Uh, we had the same comments, you know, oh my gosh, all these subdivisions, we're going to have increased traffic, um, it's going to be a mess, and, you know, you have people, you know, we have hundreds of people live out in these subdivisions now, and they all seem to, you know, eventually they work. Um, you know, we talk about the size and prices of the homes, you know, I don't see these as starter homes, I think you're very good at, uh, Ms. Campy, in pointing out the fact that these, these homes are not uh, designed or priced for minimum wage jobs, and what they do do, I think I would classify these as step-up homes. In other words, that, you know, we now have people that, that are living in Troy that maybe be renting or maybe in, be living in a smaller sized home, uh, maybe an older home, and they, they look at this new subdivision and say, hey, maybe this is our time to move up, to step up to something a little bit bigger, something that's newer, um, and what that means is that then their house or their rental property then becomes available for somebody else, you know. So again, it's, it's these homes are, st you know, you, I guess you could classify them as step-up homes. You know, they're going to attract, you know, people maybe from Troy, maybe from other different areas. Uh, but again, what that does that frees up the real estate that these people were living in, uh, maybe at a lower price. That were, you know, the the people that are just starting out with their careers could then afford and and. You know, and actually have it some place to live in Troy. So I think there, there's, a, there's a positive to this. It may not be that you're right, you may not be able to put uh, minimum wage uh, workers in these types of homes, but again, I think that um, you know, people that have lived, uh, they're living in maybe smaller homes that have uh, that spent a lot of time in their career and have had gotten some increases in income, um, they, can say, they can look at them and say, well, I can afford a $250,000 home and, and go from there. So you have to look at it, I guess, in a different in, in different uh, perspectives. Um, you know, as far as the schools are concerned, of course, that's not our bailiwick. You know, we have no influence in the schools. Uh, I did not see anybody from the schools coming in tonight and saying, "Hey, we just can't do this. Uh, we, we're, we're actually stuffed with uh, students." Um, you know, I look at it from my experience. I graduated in Troy in 1969, Troy High School. We had 330 students in our graduating class. And I think uh, recently Troy High School graduated a class of 340. And we didn't have the junior high school back then. The junior high school wasn't even built yet. So as far as you know, you know, classroom utilization, uh, I'm sure it is, some of the schools is getting a little tight. Uh, the schools have gone to the public twice uh, in the last seven years. Uh, with recommendations and, and uh, on uh, new new schools, uh, and of course with uh, uh, looking at uh, raising our taxes to do that, uh, as you mentioned, they're in the process of doing this again, and I would take a look at that. Uh, probably somebody somebody out in Kensington would probably have to reduce their standard of living by two dollars a day to afford the uh, new schools. Uh, so again, that's uh, when you look at this thing. If, if uh, you know you're truly concerned about the schools, then I would. Uh, 
make sure that you're uh, you're volunteering and, and making sure that the message gets out on on the benefit of these new, any new schools that the school system would propose. But we have no control over that. Um, uh, somebody said it should be maintain agricultural uh, zoning. Uh, again, uh, you know, if, if you, uh, I was amazed several years ago. I took a, a trip uh, out on Route uh, 70 West towards Indianapolis, and out, I think it was on Route 57, State Route or Interstate 57, into uh, northern uh, Missouri. And I can tell you, from Indianapolis West, there's absolutely nothing but farmland. We will never starve to death as a country. And so whether we, we worry about 58 acres in Troy as being agricultural, there are hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland that we use and produce food. And I, I don't think this is, you know, whether it's agricultural or subdivision, according to the master plan, it could be commercial or it could be industrial. So, you know, what are, you know, what are your druthers on that, you know? Uh, the last thing I would look at is that if, if in fact we approve this this change, this zoning change, and a subdivision does develop here, then the question is what is what is the city of Troy's responsibilities? Um, you know, our master plan essentially says is that we are we at some point we are going to extend Swales Road to a point where Wilson Road coming uh, to the south will match and that essentially Nashville Road will no longer run into uh, State Route 55. Um, that's a lot of digging, a lot of construction. I'm sure it's expensive. Um, you know, we, is the city willing to do, I mean, is the city willing to do that? Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, we can, we, uh, uh, you know, we look at, you know, for some reason the city is always behind uh, in infrastructure. It took 40 years 40 years to develop Stanfield Road. Uh, I, I moved to Troy back. I moved back to Troy in 1978. Uh, Honda had just moved in. No sidewalks, no curbs. Uh, maybe they had curbs. Anyway, it just took a long, long time to get that developed. And we are now just getting sidewalks and recreational trails along Stanfield after 40 years. And I don't think uh, you know the residents of Nash, on the, the residents of Kensington. And this new subdivision would be uh, as patient as maybe some other people have been over the course of time. I, I think that if, in fact, that, that the subdivision gets built, that it's up to the city of Troy to uh, start making improvements on Nashville Road, uh, putting in curbs and sidewalks where necessary, or possibly recreational trails. I think the developer's responsibility in this is to help. Um, I looked at uh, our own, uh, uh, I live out in the uh, Sixth Ward, and we just had uh, Redwood. Uh, apartments is in the process of uh, building out there. The first thing they did is they put in an extra lane of, of an extra lane. They put in curbs and they put in sidewalks for the entire length of their property. Um, I think that the, the uh, anybody that builds out there uh, would have that same responsibility. I think this, if the city needs to put in uh, storm drains or whatever else is required, and I think that the city uh, should be looking at that. And of course the uh, the uh, deal that the city worked out with the residents of uh, Reserve in Washington, uh, you know, uh, they did not for, they did not uh, require sidewalks and curbs at the Reserve of Washington with the idea that we would get a left-hand turn lane, uh, which they uh, they built. Uh, but on the other side is that uh, it was explained to me that the uh, property owners in Reserve of Washington, when time came to put in curbs and sidewalks or recreational trail. That would be the they, they would be assessed for that. So I think that um, again, I think the builders of Kensington are long gone, and uh, so it'd probably be the responsibility of the homeowners or the property owners in Kensington to help fund uh, any uh, additional improvements we need on the east side of the of the of, the, uh, of Nashville from that standpoint. Um, my gosh, I think that's about it. So uh, that. Mr. Phillips, you have uh, some comments I know you want to make. Well, I, I, you know, in thinking this through and listening to comments of the residents out there and, and in my own uh, trying to put myself aside from living in, in Kensington itself and just looking at it from my position as a representative of the city of Troy, I think that we should, 
quite honestly amend that and accept it in as agricultural residential and look at plan development and not um, the R5 uh, zoning, which would give our staff a little bit more time to review the requirement to the developer to submit plans beforehand, that we know everything that's going in and that we can negotiate whatever the manipulations are there for whatever, whatever, whatever to retention, detention ponds, uh, the roadway design and other things. I think that gives uh, a little bit more, I hate to use this word, but control so that we, the city, uh, can make sure that everything is addressed uh, as we would normally do with curb sidewalks, gutters, etc. Um, I, I, I think that that is a more prudent check and balance to make sure that the developer does what they're going to be doing or say they're going to be doing. We do have a, an untested uh, developer to a degree. Uh, we, you know, we were really sold on the workforce housing price tag on this and this is not being living up to that building. So I'm concerned for that. Whatever is in there, whether there is uh, the lower price point or a higher price point, it's going to affect my property values by going up either way. It does not matter. Mm -hmm. But the uh, concerns of the residents and that sort of thing, I think that we kind of owe them a little bit extra insurance to make sure things are going to be done in a, in a really prudent manner. So I would suggest agricultural residential to the city specs and get away from the county zoning of agriculture at the moment and give staff and the developer more time to develop their plans and see them before and just going into a blind R5 uh, situation because we had the same thing with uh, Casey's that generated uh, a, a boatload of uh, discussion after the fact because they were zoned, <coughs> excuse me, they were zoned right off the bat and they came in with their plans and nobody had uh, any ability to negotiate anything on top of that. Uh, after the fact, uh, as long as all their I's are crossed and T's dotted, uh, they're, uh, they're going to be able to build whatever they want to build on. So that takes away a little bit of uh, oversight uh, for city staff. So that's my suggestion on this. I, if we're going to stick with the price point that is presented and eventually get to an R5 with plan development, I'm okay with that. But uh, it's a stepping stone in my in my uh, eyes. So your your recommendation is to go into a, a city or a city zoned agricultural residential residential right. Mr. Schilling. Go ahead. If, if I can be reminded also, is there a timeline we're under for rezoning property that's brought in with county zoning? Uh, there is no set uh, timeline. Uh, you cannot simply table it. You have to take some kind of action. There have been other rezonings where for you know legitimate reasons, like when we do moratoria, um, that uh, it may go additional readings to get more information. Uh, but there is there's there's a clock if there's not another reason to go additional readings. It just can't simply be tabled. Uh, that does have to be acted upon eventually. And once the rezoning takes place, whatever that underlying zoning is, the developer has to go through the process of coming back through staff, planning commission, and back to council for the actual approval of the development plans? Is that the correct uh, That is correct. This is, these are two totally separate things. This is just a, a zoning of the property into the city zoning from the county zoning as annexed. Um, the, the entirely separate process is uh, whether it's uh, a, a conventional subdivision or uh, there's a request for uh, plan development. And this is completely curiosity question. Is this the property the school had originally, the school system, I should yeah, say? That is my understanding, yes. Okay. Thank you. I would like to get some more information, especially what the city's plans are for the 
pronational road and that type of thing. I think. Uh, well, I can. I, if if I can, there were some comments made, made that, that maybe I can address a couple of those. Fire things. away. All right. First of all, with regards to the uh, comprehensive plan, we are in the process of evaluating uh, a. a, a I was going to say a design firm, but a firm to lead us through that process. Um, we are close to bringing that to council for a recommendation. That again is a design firm that uh, we're estimating the comprehensive plan process um, to take between 12 and 18 months. So it's going to take a while. Yes, yeah, so we're not going. To, that's not going to do us any good here. Well, it, it and it and it really could. That's it. Could not because. Um, like any other moratorium uh, related to uh, uh, to zoning, that would include uh, oh, let me throw one out hypothetically parking lots. Um, that uh, once it's in the process, it is grandfathered from any future moratorium. So, right. so can't use that as as the excuse. However, uh, as part of the comprehensive plan, it will include an evaluation and a recommendation on uh, updates to the transportation improvement plan, which is a subset of the comprehensive plan. So that will be part of the process. Uh, I can say that when we've had uh, uh, higher level conversations with this developer, uh, we have talked about um, realigning uh, Nashville as it gets close to uh, 55 so that when it comes into 55, it actually curves to the west so that the actual intersection is a true 90 degree T intersection, uh, which it is not now, because 55 goes to, uh, angles, and then so it's not it's not actual. Okay, that's important. That is a that is a traffic. You, you try to avoid anything but T's, if possible. Um, we are also going to be um, having our traffic engineer do an analysis of the speeds on Nashville now that we, uh, now that both sides of the road are located in Troy. That was relatively recently. Uh, we know it is 55 out there right now, and so now's the time to look at those speeds to, to try to manage those better. Um, with regard, uh, regarding storm drainage, I think there were a, a lot of comments positively um, explaining uh, storm drainage between retention ponds, detention ponds, uh, storm piping and catch basins, um, as well as uh, council. Uh, I, I don't have exact examples, but I'm sure that you'll uh, you'll recall just from legislation over the past few years, and it happens um, not frequently but often that uh, we will come to you and ask to upsize uh, utilities. Uh, that includes, you know, sewer, uh, water, uh, could be lift stations, pump stations, but it can also and has also uh, involved uh, storm storm drainage, uh, retention, detention ponds, um, and, and areas uh, where we would pay the difference, the up costs over and above what's required by the uh, the code. Uh, if we wanted to see additional storm drainage built into a plan. Uh, that flexibility can be negotiated um, at any point, uh, most often with PDs. Uh, one, uh, one upsizing that comes to mind that has been very effective, I think if you ask the residents along Finsbury, uh, when um, Harlow uh, built the community center for Halifax Villas and Halifax Estates just uh, north of uh, Finsbury. Uh, we did pay to upsize the basin that he put in, uh, and as a result, there has been very little, if any, flooding of the street like there was prior to uh, that, uh, that upsizing and that, uh, that storm drainage being put in there. Uh, so that's just that, that's probably the most recent example, uh, at least the, the most recent that I can think of. But those are the kind of techniques that we can use and uh, conversations that we can have. So, but you're saying it'd probably be better to have the PD. I mean, from 
I'm not recommending one way or the other. That's uh, that's not our role here. All I can do is do is forward the planning commission. Um, we do make effective use of the plan developments. I think. Uh, uh, every one of them that we have brought to council, I think, has been a good process, has, co has come up with a, a good, reasonable, uh, well-negotiated uh, development uh, in every case. Uh, I don't anticipate this would be any different. Um, I, I also don't believe, and Austin, you're in the audience, you can, you can correct me, um, but uh, overall, the process timeline is... Uh, really not that much different, at, uh, if at all, when it comes to uh, conventional versus PD. Uh, there's, there's additional work that I believe needs to be done up front with the PD, but overall it does not really extend the time, time frame, especially if the expectations are known up front and there's not a lot of re, uh, there's not rework that needs to be done. Okay. I see two things here. Maybe we have a choice of we can uh, go to a second reading on that or a fourth reading on this. We can recommend to go to a fourth reading. Uh, it gives a couple of weeks more uh, to maybe get some of these questions answered. Um, or we can, uh, of course, of course, we can approve the, uh, uh, the plan as uh, submitted by the planning commission, or we can attempt to amend it. If we attempt to amend it, it'll take a super majority vote, though. Is that right? Correct. Yes. I I agree with the things that we have said about uh, rezonings often bring these same types of comments. We hear them. Um, it's it's simply not unusual. And I do think that there are improvements that will come with some of the things that have been mentioned, especially drainage, um, things on Nashville Road, things can be corrected. Um, whether or not something is affordable housing, that is subjective and depends on where you are. I just don't know if I see at this point um, a reason to not uh, approve what the Planning Commission has recommended. I certainly don't mind if this goes to a, a fourth reading, but that's not really our call tonight since we're just reporting this out of committee to well, council. I can, I can ask but you to go to fourth reading. Certainly, we can, can do that, but that's a council um, issue. Uh, but I think as far as as what we've heard, what we've seen, understanding that there are concerns, um, but I'm not sure that um, approving this with R5 zoning, and I certainly appreciate the, the information about the difference between R5 and, and R4 as far as what the developer is looking at, I'm not sure um, I don't know what we would accomplish by not approving this. I don't know what other information um, we could get, especially since we are only approving the zoning of this property and the actual plan for what is to be developed on it will come back through Planning Commission. So as far as the zoning, I don't really feel that any other information would change. The way I feel. Comments? In this situation, I would prefer to have the planning development and work through that process a little bit more closely with the city administration, having a little bit more oversight in it. I, I would I would agree, with Mr. Pierce. I think the, the PD is it sounds like that's a, a better option. And I would just ask how we do that out of committee, other than having a negative committee report to approve this? Uh, basically, what you, what you would do is that you would recommend um, a different, less dense zoning uh, than what they're seeking. Uh, that way you're establishing an underlying R zone. Um, and then 
then a uh, PD process becomes legitimate. So, so we have would to have R5 to recommend zoning. amending the zoning to R4, potentially. To, to whatever, R, whatever R, it could be AR, it could be R1, 2, 3, or 4, or 3B, for that matter. We have that, too, also. I would think... Uh, with, with, but, but we would not be the ones to recommend a plan development. That would be simply something right. that was possible. Right. Correct. That, that is, that. the PD process is driven by the applicant. That is an application-based process um, on a piece of property. But that process cannot begin if that piece of property is not zoned for the type of use they want to do. You could have... A, uh, th this uh, county agriculture lot, uh, lot that's there. Uh, we could have had an applica uh, application for um, a manufacturing facility. Uh, the and and if we wanted them to do a PD, there would have to be one of the M M1, two or three zoning district would have to be established first before a manufacturing PD could then be uh, Put in there. explored. Commercial is the same way. But following that out, if, if we recommend uh, the underlying residential zoning district, then the developer could come back, propose a similar development to what they would be proposing now as a plan development. And there would be what difference? I guess I'm under. I'm trying well, to understand okay, what the difference. The difference is, is that between the planning commission and the council, you can negotiate. Well, you know, we don't want these lots as small as small as in R5, but we understand that R4. So, can you make the lots uh, in between, um, or can you have a certain percentage of the lots at some level and, and some uh, uh, another level? Um, can you do something different with uh, Nashville? Can you oversize the uh, the storm storm drainage? Um, it also gives the developer the opportunity to come back with, well, you know, we we've got 21 percent in with green space. If we're going to do more of the storm uh, the storm that takes away from that, we'd like to do something a little different on this end. It gives gives both parties. The flexibility to negotiate, and the council, and the plan, and the planning commission at their various levels, then can finesse. Yeah. Okay. So, so we could yeah. we could do. City has an agricultural zoning now. That would be the uh, the uh, agricultural residential. We have an agricultural well, residential, and then the uh, the transition between agriculture and residential. And the important part is it includes the word residential in it is the AR. That is the least dense residential district that. And then we, we could always go back, and if we wanted to do an R5, we could change it, change the zoning again. On you that. could rezone it R5 if you wanted to do the traditional R5 uh, later. Yes, you could do that. That would involve a complete rezoning process again, whereas a PD process establishes project zoning for that law, uh, for that uh, uh, piece of ground at the same time as a project, a subdivision in this case, is being considered and approved. So it's all at once. I, I can go along with zoning it another kind of residential zoning. I just think that that's, we, we're going to find ourselves back in a similar position with a plan development, but I can certainly go along with that. Well, I can, I can take, in, I, I take into consideration that the, that the developer, uh, they made it again, trying to build as economically as possible, which is one of their stated goals, and I think that the, the uh, R5 would probably be the best solution for that. Uh, but again, I'm just, you know, I'm not ready to commit to that right now. I, I think it, um, I just need some, something's missing here, and I'm not sure exactly what it is. Um, 
so I would either I would be more in favor of going to an, another reading or we, we do an, an agricultural agricultural and then go back and look at this thing in more detail if I may yeah. is trying to appraise mr. Titterington it doesn't matter what the zoning is as long as it's different than the R5 to get to the end result so you can go above or below AR or the R4, or you go with the R3, R2, R1. It doesn't matter whether they either be uh, designation. But eventually, they may wind up back at, the, at a request with the R5, as you're indicating, and it's just part of the process. But my end result is trying to get the plan development portion of this. But it's going to take a change from the R5 to some other, other zoning district. My suggestion is that the, the committee suggests a, uh, an amendment to it and you designate the, uh, the, the zoning layer that you would like to choose. My suggestion is the AR, but you can choose whatever you want. I would, I would think, uh, yeah, the AR would give us most latitude. I would be uh, favorable to that. I think we can do that and then come back and do this thing at uh, so we get some more so, information. We, we can change the zoning at any time. We just, can. just to reiterate, we would recommend as a committee agricultural residential okay. zoning, which would require a supermajority when it goes to council because it's amended from what was recommended by the planning commission. Am I understanding that correctly? That's correct. Uh, that is that is correct. Uh, Sue and I were um, caucusing about the exact process. Mm -hmm. We'll have to consult with Mr. Kerber, Kerber on that. I'm not sure that you can amend at committee and have the amended ordinance on the next agenda. It may require a vote to amend, which would then be the uh, council. Can, uh, but our committee could make a recommendation yes. to to make it an AR, and then the amendment would be taken. It would be a motion to amend <laughs> at council. Which would take a super majority to approve. Would that be the correct That's procedure? What we're thinking. We we'll yeah. want to verify that with Mr. Kerber. Okay. So in essence, the committee is actually recommending not favorably about going ahead with the R5 zoning, with a recommendation to council that it be amended to agricultural residential. residential. Yeah. So we get some more information on this thing. Yes. That sounds like the deal. That sounds good. I think we, we're in agreement on that. So. Okay, we got one more thing on the agenda. Um, oh, yes, provide a recommendation to council regarding extending the moratorium on self storage facilities by another 90 days to November 3, 2023. Are we going to have any comments on that from? Uh, well, as the, uh, as the memo states, um, February 6th, you adopted the 180-day moratorium. Staff has been finalizing some recommendations moving forward. Um, those would be zoning changes, so they would require a, uh, basically the same process as you're going through with the right rezoning. Now. Right. Um, and so to make sure that there's enough time for uh, deliberation and readings and uh, the public hearing, et cetera, uh, I believe the current um, ending to the moratorium, yes, is August 5th, and so to give us uh, uh, more flexibility, more time, we're asking for a three-month uh, extension. Okay. Any questions or comments from staff from the uh, committee? When's the expected end date for staff so finalizing this? Uh, getting a recommendation to you uh, mm -hmm. should be within a couple of weeks. Yeah, at the um, 28th meeting, I have planning commission, and then it'll be forwarded on the council. Thank uh, you. Uh, at the uh, two weeks from Wednesday, it'll go to the uh, for a recommendation for planning commission. Uh, assuming that they make a recommendation to you after at that meeting, then it will start the process. Okay. Comments from council members. Staff, our audience tonight. Okay, seeing none, um, I think um, what's our preference here? Go ahead and 
move forward with the move forward with the extending the more term. I think we can do that. Is there anything else before this committee tonight? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you so much.